Hey, how are you? I hope you're having a fun October. Welcome to episode 97 of Boundary Break. I'm your host, She Says, and really quick, if you haven't heard of the series before, all we do here on this show is just take the camera anywhere we want to take a look at unobtainable perspectives of some of our favorite games, and in the process, show and explain some developer techniques, and in some cases, unused content. So this week it's going to be a hodgepodge of Resident Evil games. Some of them aren't quite popular enough to be full episodes, while others just don't have enough to show. But naturally, if you want to see a full episode of any of the games covered this week, just let me know in the comments, tell me what you want to see from the episode, and I'll do my best to make it happen for you. But with that said, let's get going. Ugh. So the first thing I want to talk about is something weird that I noticed in Umbrella Chronicles, which is the first on-rails Resident Evil shooting game for the Wii. And what I discovered is that there is a texture underneath the female character's necks. Now this was never used on neither Jill or Rebecca, and of course it suggests that at one time there was supposed to be unique death animations. However, what turns this discovery on its head is that the male characters don't have this at all. Both Chris and Billy, for example. All you can find inside of them is the typical geometry jank, which is just a little bit of geometry mesh and some stretched out textures. Next up is a viewer request, and as always, you can follow me on Twitter if you want to make a viewer request or find out why I've been gone for three weeks. And this viewer wants to know if you can get a better look at Lisa Trevor's face from the Resident Evil remake. See, the aftermath of Lisa Trevor's tragic backstory is that she wears faces over her face. And luckily, I have the character model here, and if I remove all the geometry that is the faces to Lisa Trevor, she has an entire head modeled underneath, which is incredibly unusual in video games. And to add to the insanity of this, you can also remove the clothing to show the monstrous form underneath, which at no point is ever shown to the player. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I didn't think I was gonna find anything, so this is like insane. Same to me. So I kind of wanted to take you through my process a little bit here, because sometimes it can be a little bit funny how you end up making certain discoveries on this show. And in this case, if you were wanted a close-up of the PS1 liquor from Resident Evil 2, and while I was making my way over there, there's a scene where the liquor crawls by the window, and I thought, you know what, it'd be kind of cool to see what each one does in both the Dark Size Chronicle version of it and the Resident Evil 2 version of it. And just so you can see for yourself, this is what happens in the Dark Side Chronicles version with all of its fancy Wii graphics. But let's take it back to the PlayStation 1 original, that liquor. Well, in order to find out, I have to make the textures that are the environment completely invisible. That way there's nothing obstructing our view, like it is in the original version of the game. And before I could finish removing all the textures, I noticed that when I shifted the camera around, there's this black, untextured object behind the door. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out what it was. I was ready to present it to you folks as just an unidentified object. Especially after I removed the textures and saw that the liquor just fades into black. But... <laughs> But thankfully, because there was a texture that I was able to put an object in front of, you can see if you shift the camera just before the scene plays out, the liquor turns into black and then all of this geometry just kind of smushes into that object. And when you slow the footage down, you can see it happening, which, wow, that is, that is pretty lucky there. Because if all the textures were removed, it would have just been completely black, just like the void. I would have never seen that. And truthfully, if I never saw the transformation happen, I would have never guessed that this black untextured object was originally the liquor that crawls by the window. Okay, so alternatively, let's look over at Resident Evil 1. Kind of like the same concept. There's a character in the window. What's going on with the character outside of the boundaries? And in this case, we're talking about that famous dog scene, as it happens to be the first jump scare in the entire series. Well, thankfully for this episode, we were able to get the free camera working on the DS version of Resident Evil. And in that one, the first dog just kind of randomly appears. I looked all around and it wasn't stored anywhere, unfortunately. Although, funny enough, no two experiences are the same, I guess. And the second dog is standing there in a stationary position until the player walks over the trigger. Now, what about Resident Evil Remake? Can we expect the same results? Triggering the first zombie dog is a lot like how it was in the first game that I showed you. And the second is a little bit funny in that the window crashes before you can even see a dog. And while we're doing comparisons between Resident Evil DS and Resident Evil Remake, let's see what's going on behind that corner before you meet your first zombie. 
In Resident Evil DS, the zombie is there at all times. He just doesn't have any animations, so it's just a still model over another still model. And because this one more accurately portrays the original Resident Evil experience, you can see the severed head of the stars member. Whereas in the remake, that doesn't happen, nor do you get the chance to see the zombie a little bit early. Also because there's a lot of aliasing on DS games as well as fixed camera angles that pans the camera pretty far away from the character models in general. I wanted to give you a close up on the Jill model and the Barry model and show you how much detail they've put into these things. This was just way too perfect not to share. Now there's a scene recreated for Resident Evil 2 in Dark Side Chronicles where the characters are reading a message off of a wall and in that moment Ada slips away and when the characters look to turn around they wonder where she went. Where'd she go? Ada? She was just here. Where'd she go? So where did she go? <laughs> She went down into the ground. That is where she went. Fina, I know that Ada's more able-bodied than the average person, but uh, I didn't know that she had that sort of talent. No, but seriously, in a situation like this, I would have just expected the character to disappear, not slowly sink into the ground. Next up, let's talk about some of the bosses in Umbrella Chronicles. So in the segment for Resident Evil Zero, which by the way I find to be a great game, I know that's kind of an unpopular opinion, there's a scene where the last boss throws an elevator platform over off to the side, and if you were to take the camera outside of the boundaries you could see that it didn't really go that far and it's hanging in the void. Also if we take the camera outside of the final confrontation, you can see that the sky that's peeking through the hangar doors is in fact just one sheet of texture, unlike the majority of this game that has an actual skybox. And also in Resident Evil 1 when you're on top of the roof, you might notice that tyrant jumps out of the hole in an attempt to surprise the player. Well, unlike the scenes that we just looked at with the dog, you can see that tyrant is stored in there before he makes the animation. I think a lot of you are going to appreciate this. As you know, in Resident Evil 1 and 2, they have pre-made backgrounds with no 3D depth. So if the concept of my show is to explore areas out of bounds, it doesn't really work as well with these older games. But that's why Umbrella and Dark Side Chronicles are in this episode. A lot of the environments to these older games are completely remade in full 3D. Like for example what you're looking at here with the police station from Resident Evil 2. I thought it'd be fun to just move the camera around in this space because even when you play the game, there's a very deliberate track that the characters go on so you don't get to really explore any of these environments. something that was really odd about Resident Evil 2. For some reason, I could turn any texture on any character model completely invisible. I wish I could do that for every game, because then you can see things about character models that are normally a little more difficult to see by just pointing the camera inside. Like for example with Leon here, he's made up of parts. And then those parts assemble into a marionette-like character, which is very common for PlayStation 1 games. And as a result, you end up seeing some really neat stuff, like when the feet meet with the ankles, the ankle part of the character model turns into spikes. And the reason for this is that when the foot moves, the player can see a visible indent between the foot and the leg. And also naturally, for a zoom out, I have to do the very first screen of Raccoon City from Resident Evil 2. And once again, as you know, this is what it looks like in the original game, where it's just a big old giant PNG file. But the environment was remade for Dark Side Chronicles, and it looks very accurate to what it used to be. Oh my goodness, yeah, super janky setup this week. I do apologize. Um, I still don't have my office set up, so uh, everything has just been like really bootleggy. I kind of want to show you the, the office, quote unquote, that I've been working with this week. Here, check this out. This is, this is what I've been working with. Let me see. Yeah. Like, my little desk is inside of the living room with the chair and everything. It's kind of sad, um, but... You know, you do what you gotta do. <laughs> I've, I've just been really excited to get back into making videos, so I couldn't wait for um, the office to get set up. So, um, you know, I hope that it wasn't too distracting. I, I was worried that it was gonna be a little bit echoey in the episode, but, you know, I think it came out okay. You let me know what you think. But, um, yeah, so anyways, hopefully before October's over, we're going to do 
uh, Silent Hill 3 episode with Neko Run again. Um, I'm actually really excited about that. And then after that, it's going to be a Zelda game for November. Um, you can decide what game that's going to be. Or rather, you can try to guess. I kind of already have it in my head which one it's going to be. Maybe we'll do two Zelda games in November. I think that'd be really cool. Haven't decided yet. Although I have an idea for a guest. Um, but I won't say anything about that just yet. Um, but yeah, other than that, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope um, you stick with me. I know I've been gone for a while. It's going to get right back into nearly weekly schedules again. So not going to disappear like some other YouTubers do. All right, well, anyways, obvious jump cut right there. <laughs> and um, I I'll see you next week, hopefully. All right, take care.